In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in us the fire of your love. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, so now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to thank all of you for coming out this night, uh, fearless people. No fear of uh, COVID. Huh? That's part of the greatness of youth, huh? lack of fear. And thank you for wearing those masks. I had to pull mine down. I look like I have whiskers on me or something, but that's how it has to be. I'm very happy to be with you this evening. It reminds me of other times when uh, I'd have... 50, 60 kids, the eighth period. Many of them had come in from practicing football and we had no air conditioning and no fans on the East Coast when it was hot and humid. So I have uh, fond memories of kids who, uh, despite all those things, would uh, come in and uh, after a little, few little threats from me, just a few, they'd keep from falling asleep. So I am uh, happy to be with you this evening. And there's a friend of mine here this evening. So I'm not uh, uh, totally uh, a stranger. Is that right, Fernando? Yes, uh, Fernando's sister was with us here when I had confirmation classes. And um, I remember Fernando when he wasn't as tall as he is now. So I'm very happy to be with you. I'm going to try my very best tonight not to bore you. Uh, it was an intention I had when I came because nobody likes to be bored. Now, I can't sing or dance too well. This is the house of God after all. And secondly, if I could, I've got a sort of a bad back. So it just gave me some trouble before I came. So I said, by hell or high water, I'm coming anyway. So my back hasn't been so bad. What are we going to talk about tonight? We're going to talk about the saints. Now, there is a sign up there that Vito put up there that makes me laugh. I don't mean to be laughing at you, Vito, but it says a speaker series. I never heard anyone say that about me in my life. You know, speaker series, they're usually for very important college professors and people like that. And I'm a lowly Franciscan, so you uh, r raise my uh, standing to very high levels, Vito. Now, today is called the solemnity of all the saints. What is a solemnity? When you hear that word solemn, what comes to your mind? Solemn. Take, take a guess at it. I won't say you're stupid, so take a guess at it. What do you mean by a solemn feast? How about a feast of great importance? Christmas and Easter are said to be solemn feasts. They're great feasts in the liturgy of the church. 
And so today we have what we call the solemnity of all the saints. Now these questions you must answer or I'll keep you for an hour afterwards. Have any of you ever met a saint? I must be intimidating them. Have you ever met a saint, Fernando? Could you tell me a little bit about the saint you met? <laughs> say, it, say it louder. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Good. Very good. I've met a few saints in my time. Among kids, I've met a few saints in my time. Are saints uh, strange characters? Weird, you'd say, or whatever words the vocabulary changes, so I better be careful. Well, saints are ordinary people, people like ourselves. They have temperaments and they have faults and failings as well as virtues. But they work through things. And when the people around them practice meanness, they practice kindness. And when the people around them called others losers and loners, they reached out to them. Being a saint is about being like God. And it's not as difficult as sometimes we think. When I was your age, I was convinced that holiness belonged to priests and to sisters. I never thought about it for being, having to anything to do with my mother and father, my brother and my sisters, the neighbors around us. I didn't think they were called to be holy people. But that is a false idea. Each person is called to be holy. It's called a universal call to every single person. It is a call to be holy, an invitation to live a holy life. So what does it mean to be holy? Do you have any idea what it might be like to be holy? I suppose I'll have to start calling on the teachers. What does it mean to be holy? I asked that question once of a sister when I was about 10 years old. She said, don't you know anything? I said, that's why I'm asking you. She was a good person, but she could uh, make you stop and think. So to be holy means to do the will of God. And some people think that doing the will of God is what's good for God. But it's the opposite. The will of God is what's best for us. And to do the will of God, what does that mean? It means to love, because God is love. To love. What does that mean? We know what the uh, media tells us it means. 
But what does uh, God tell us it means? It means to will the good of the other person. It means to want what is best for the other person. Not necessarily what is best for me first, but what is best for that other person, a person I may love, a person I may care about. It's not about manipulation. It's not about use or abuse. Nobody likes that. It's about to will the good of another person. Now, how about uh, these saints, if we go back to them? Who are the canonized saints? Now, most of you would know that answer. Who are the canonized saints? Come on. Yes, I recognize you too. I almost didn't. Your hair is short. Yes. Who else might be a canonized? What does it mean to be a canonized saint? Yes, good man. Thank you. Uh, the canonized saints, you'd find them on the calendar of the church. What is a requirement to be canonized? There is a one main requirement to be canonized. What is it? Vito knows. You know. What is it? Exactly. What's your name? Claire, thank you. You have to be dead to be a canonized saint. So to be canonized means that people are put forward to the church and uh, the people say, we know this was a holy person and we'd like the church to tell everybody they were holy. And the church said, okay, bring on the evidence. <laughs> and the evidence being that they practiced virtue, goodness, kindness, mercy, forgiveness to a great extent. Can you think of any saint that practiced forgiveness to a great extent? Yes, clear. Pope John Paul II, how did he show, thank you, how did he show that forgiveness? Can you say it a bit louder? Exactly. He visited in, uh, thank you, he visited in the prison in Rome the man who shot him in St. Peter's Square. Aga, Aga Ali, was that the name? Something like that. And um, uh, when he went in and sat before him, uh, his assailant said, I aimed correctly, I hit you, You should be dead, and here you sit before me. And it was said it had an effect upon his life, such goodness, such forgiveness. We think about uh, Thomas More, the great man who was Lord Chancellor of England under Henry VIII. If you ever want to see a movie, and uh, especially a court scene, look at a movie called The Man for All Seasons. Uh, Robert Bolt uh, wrote the book, and he made the movie for how much? 
$4,000. And he had won all kinds of awards. The scene there in that courtroom of that lone man, a Lord Chancellor, brilliant man, and all the bishops and priests, not all, almost all, of England against him because he wouldn't compromise his conscience. I don't want to get into too many of them. I'd get carried away. But forgiveness was something that was very visible in all of them. Now, to be a saint, when we add up all the check marks and we're coming to the end of our lives, it is often said that there is only one real sorrow, and that is not to be a saint. Did you ever see a U-Haul following a funeral? You did. I never. You did. You saw a U-Haul. Oh, you're anyone who said they did, they're from another planet. Huh? Why do, don't U-Hauls follow funerals? You ain't taking nothing with you. You won't need it where you're going. What will you take with you? Only. The good you have done and the love we have shown. We won't take anything else. So, to be holy, to do the will of God, to love, and to wish the good of another is a good beginning. Now, if you followed today's gospel when you went to Mass, it is a very interesting one. Notice how it opens. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. Mountains were very important in the gospel. You have the mount where God gives the law to Moses, Mount Sinai. You have the Mount of the Transfiguration. You have the Mount of the Ascension. But before that, you had Mount Calvary. Lots of mountains. So Jesus goes up a mountain. He wants to be seen. He can see the people in front of him. And then it said, and after he sat down, why did they have to put such an insignificant thing at the opening of the gospel? He sat down. There is a chair up there in back of the altar. Cathedrals have chairs in them, cathedrals, places, places from which a bishop teaches. So when he sat down, St. Matthew is preparing us. He's in an important place. He's going to do something very important. And there was an old translation that used to puzzle me as a kid. And it said, and he opened his mouth. He sat down. He opened his mouth. What's all that about? He sat down, he's going to teach. He opened his mouth, he's going to do what the great orators did. Cicero, Plato, Aristotle, they were the great teachers. He opens his mouth, he's going to say something of great importance. And what does he say? 
it says, his disciples gathered all around him, and then what did he begin to do? He began to teach them. And here he begins with what we call the Beatitudes. And the word Beatitude, can you guess what it might mean? Any of you study Latin in high school these days? No, they don't teach Latin anymore, oh dear. Well, you're lucky because it's mighty hard. So, beatitude means happiness. The beatitudes, you might, I might say, are like a GPS. They're a guide, a roadmap to being holy. The beatitudes, a GPS, a roadmap to holiness. And how do they start out? Well, it starts out by saying, blessed are the merciful. Pope uh, Francis often uses the expression tender mercy. He talks about it a lot. He dedicated a whole year to the theme of mercy, the year 2015. He called it the year of mercy. So mercy is tender love and kindness. Like the, um, the um, Good Samaritan, remember. He sees the poor man beaten on the road, robbed, and he goes. The others pass by on the other side, we are told. That's significant. The Samaritan drew close to him. He went over near him. He bent down. He touched him. He cleaned his wounds. And then he didn't have a BMW, so he had a donkey, a burro. Huh? And he takes the poor man and he puts him up on his own beast, it says. And he takes, them to, takes him to an inn and he says to the keeper, you take care of him. I'll give you this money now. I'll be back in a day or two. And if he owes any more, I will take care of it. That's the working out the reality that we call tender mercy. Then Jesus says, blessed are the clean of heart. That doesn't mean I don't have any sexual sins. That's not, that's what I thought it used to mean. It doesn't. To be clean of heart means to be a person who has focus, to a person who is not fragmented, to a person who has what they call and desires one thing in life. Well, won't that make my life boring? It won't. If you're an integrated person, if you're a focused person, you'll be a happy person. You're not pulled this way and then pulled that way. Um, you know, the wheel of fortune, in many of the great cathedrals, they have a depiction of the wheel of fortune. Today I'm up, and tomorrow I'm down. Today I win, and tomorrow I lose. It's the opposite of being clean of heart. In one of the cathedrals, I'm, I think it's Rennes in, in uh, France, beside the um, Wheel of Fortune, they have the figure of Christ. I once said, what's that have to do with it? But Christ is the one stable reality there is. It's beside the wheel of fortune because it says, if you want constancy in your life, if you want to focus, focus first on the person of Jesus. So to be clean of heart means to be 
a gathered person, a focused person. If I got up every morning and said, what is the one thing I'm going to be concerned about today? One thing I'm going to focus on. Might be a good way to begin a day. Might be a good way to organize ourselves. Now, we have a beatitude that is a little strange. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness. What's that all about anyway? Hmm? Righteousness, right relationships with people, with my friends, with my family, with my teachers, with the kids I'm in school with, with my friends. I have right relationships. I have a feeling, and I have known many kids who, because they didn't focus on right relationships, they were deeply hurt. Some told me they thought someone loved them and didn't. They felt used and abused. One young girl told me, she said, I feel like an orange that the inside has been sucked out of and then what was left of me was thrown in the gutter. That stings. We have to be careful about our relationships. Be careful about people. They're not for our use. Persons are not for our use. Keep it in front of you always. Be careful. If you notice people are manipulating and using, that is not righteousness. That is not right relationship. And you will be deeply hurt. And I wouldn't wish that on anybody. It leads to suicides and all kinds of things. These Beatitudes, friends, are not a pie up in the sky for priests and sisters. They're for all of us, and they're wise, and it's good to pay attention to them. So be that kind of person who has right relationships. First of all, begin with a right relationship with God, and all your other relationships will fall into place. Some people tell me I can't go to Mass on Sunday. Why can't you? Why can't you go to Mass on Sunday? I have a soccer game at that time. I have a football practice at that time. I, have, I go to the gym at that time. Give to God what belongs to God and to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. One hour a week sets our relationships right with God. The reception of the sacraments going to confession helps us in our relationships with God. My relationship with God is good. My relationship with everybody else will be good as well. I might say, what do I hunger and thirst for today when you wake up in the morning? Ask yourself that question. Again, it might help us to focus a little bit. And then the peacemakers. Um, it's interesting that in the way I learned the Beatitudes, peacemakers came at the end. I used to be glad to see it coming because we had to memorize them. And God help you if you couldn't memorize them when you were nine and ten years old. You didn't know what they meant, but you memorized them. And later on in life, you could come to understand them. But the peacemaker, 
When I am clean of heart, when I am merciful, I radiate peace. Peace, one of the saints said, is the tranquility of order. I am ordered inside. My life is not pulled this way, that way, up and down. My life now has taken a focus. And so I experience peace. You remember the prayer of St. Francis. Lord, say it with me if you remember it. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is, what's the first one? I know it like my own name and I can't remember it. Where there is sadness, joy, where there is despair, hope, where there is hatred, love, where there is sadness, joy, O oh, Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Now, there are Beatitudes that have a negative turn to them, we might call it, blessed are you poor. Who wants to be poor? Not in the world in which we are living, but the poor that's been talked about in the Beatitudes is a different thing. You can be wealthy and still be poor because you're not attached to things. The young man in the gospel, he goes to Jesus, remember, and he said, what must I do to be perfect? And Jesus said, if you want to be perfect, well, Go sell what you have and give to the poor and come follow me and you'll find treasure in heaven. And then what happened? I'm always picking on that side over there and that's not fair. How about the guys over there in the shadows? What happened to the young man? He went home sad, isn't that right? Good man, thank you. He went home sad, and we asked, why did he go home sad? It said, because he had great possessions. It wasn't because he had great possessions, it was because he was possessed by his possessions. He couldn't let go of them. They held him back. So to be poor means to be free within. Uh, we read in the paper all the time about uh, people who lie and cheat in business. Did you notice that? And they become millionaires. And then all of a sudden, someone blows their cover. And they end up paupers. They end up with nothing. And someone gets hurt. So, wealth can be a good thing, but we better know how to use it. So, 
So we're not distracted by wealth and we're not addicted to material things. We're clean of heart, we have right relationships and we are merciful. We're doing well on the way to be peacemakers. And those who mourn, it's a strange one. The person who, who mourns is the person who is not addicted to pleasure. Pleasure is good. We all like it. But God help us if we're addicted to it. Some people pay for pleasure. They use others for their pleasure. They make pleasure the center of their lives. They won't do anything unless they feel good. Your mother and father don't feel good in the morning when they have to get up and go to work. But they do it out of love for you. And those who are meek, well, those who are meek are not weak, that's for sure. They are the people who are not addicted to honor. I, I say it this way. These people they're not addicted to power. Um, I don't have to be admired all the time, even thought well of. Inwardly, I'm free of those things. It's a great feeling not to feel you have to have power over anyone. And... Uh, Blessed are you when they insult you and utter all kinds of things against you. And then to make it even more difficult, Jesus says, rejoice and be glad. Strange, isn't it? People are saying mean things about you, insulting you. Um... I worked with a priest uh, many years ago in Father Flanagan's Boys Town in eastern Nebraska. And the kids there had come in out of the worst of it. Many of them had come off the drug scene. Many of them had been into some petty crimes. And the, uh, um, the police would say, I won't prosecute you if you go to Boys Town. And... Uh, if you don't want a police record, go to Boys Town and straighten out your life. And others were there because their families fell apart. Uh, I had a young man in a class there, a literature class. I remember him so well. His father was a violent man, especially when he was drunk. The young man sat in my class and he had a wound that went from his jawbone to his shoulder bone. His father got him one night with a knife and slit down his side of his throat. He was one of the finest uh, kids I ever taught. And uh, he often told me he was lonely and would like to go home, but uh, we would talk about it and uh, he would wait on, I said, you have a very good mind, try to graduate from high school here, and then you'll be able to help your mother and your sister. And he always listened, and uh, I got to know him very well. But there was a priest there, he had suffered too in his lifetime. He was placed in an orphanage at the age of four, and no one ever visited him again. His mother was a single mom. She couldn't take care of him, so he was put in an orphanage. He often told me what it was like. But when he spoke to the students, they said, Father Mac is the greatest man on earth. 
he would say to them, refuse to take offense. Maybe tonight you could write that somewhere inside. I will refuse to take offense. It's not easy. I'm much older than you. I wouldn't tell you how much. Because you'd say, we'll all walk out. She's too old. I'm still working on it. And I pray to God every day when things are said that are unkind or mean or sometimes they're not true. We all get it. I ask God for the grace not to take offense. And it works. And you will know peace. Another thing he used to say was refuse to be depressed. I said to him one time, are you serious? We all go through those times. He said, I know. But don't wallow in it. Do you know what it means to wallow in something? Come on. My right flank over here. What does it mean to wallow in something? Pigs swallow in the dirt. Did you ever notice they roll around if you ever saw them and they, they wallow in it? And uh, to uh, take uh, things that have happened to us and dwell on them too long without realizing all the blessings we have. You say, well, maybe I don't have that many. Did you wake up this morning and you had the sight of your eyes? Thank God for that. Did you wake up this morning and you had the light of your reason? <laughs> I hope you had. <laughs> Reasonable people. Did you wake up this morning and say, thanks be to God for my faith. Thanks be to God for my memory. Thanks be to God for the water that refreshed me and cleaned me. Find little things to thank God for, and that will help you to be overcome being depressed. So we have eight Beatitudes. Eight uh, ways, ground maps, GPS, to guide us to God. They're very beautiful. Think about them. Maybe you could read again the gospel for today. It was from the uh, fifth chapter of St. Matthew's gospel, the Beatitudes. So... By living them, we can be vehicles of God's grace and God's mercy in this world. Now, I'm going to, I've talked maybe too long. Demasiado? Hmm? About 15 minutes more. All right. Anybody have any questions? I might be able to answer them, I might not, but I'll try. And if I can't, i look up the answer. If I had a thousand dollars, I'd give it to the person who asks a question. Now I'm talking about virtual money. <laughs> Everything is virtual these days, I'm just beginning to think about it. How about if you stand up? You've been sitting and listening to me for a long time. Stand up and stretch your legs, and then we'll move to the next part. I have 15 minutes. Okay. I didn't do a good job if nobody has any questions. So I'm going to be depressed. It's going to be your fault. But man, okay, Fernando, he's bailing me out so I don't get depressed. What's the fastest way to become a saint? Well, that's a tough one. 
to become a saint. Each day, you have to begin anew. Each day, you have to focus again. Poco a poco a poco. The fastest way to become a saint is to love. Not the way the media tells us to love. Not um, the hookup culture. That's not what it means to love. That's a disaster. A recipe for disaster. Broken life. But to begin each day, we fall down, we make mistakes, and we get back up on our feet again. So it's poco a poco. Be determined. All right. Now, I was accused one time by a student. He told me, he said, I had a girlfriend, I liked her very much, and because of you, we broke up. I said, now how did I do that? And he said, well, it was like this. She wasn't a Catholic, and she used to ask me questions. And one of the questions she was always asking me about was, why do Catholics honor the saints? I couldn't tell her. He said, because you didn't teach me that. I said, oh dear, what am I going to do now? I said, could we begin now? He said, well, you better begin because uh, it's your fault. I said, oh Lord, help me. Uh, kidding myself, we're good friends. So he would say his mind. So we were talking about uh, what Catholics do. Now, I want you to listen carefully because if you have friends who are not Catholics, they could very well ask you this question. Do Catholics honor saints? There was a little girl I knew in the fourth grade in public school, and she told me that she wore a medal, a miraculous medal, it's called, with an icon of the Holy Mother of God on it. And the kids in the school <coughs> uh, used to say, oh, you're a Catholic. And you Catholics honor saints, and you're not supposed to honor saints. She said, we don't honor saints. They said, you do. Look, you're wearing a medal. You do. So she, she, she said, I know we don't. We honor God. They said, no, no, that doesn't work. You shouldn't have statues in your churches, crucifixes in your churches. Just have a cross, not a crucifix. And the little girl was bound and determined she was going to get an answer. So she spoke to a friend, a teacher whom she knew, and uh, they sat down, they made a game plan, huh? and uh, the game plan was this. God is a great artist. That's why, that's why we have up there the icon of Jesus. God is a great artist, and all artists like to have their work praised. And so when we praise the saints, and we reverence the saints, we reverence God who made them so good, so beautiful, so attractive, that they help us to love God more. They are role models for us. And by showing them respect and by praying to them, we are honoring God, the great artist, who made them to be who they are. St. Teresa of Lisieux, it was, who got that, who left us that thought, and many great scholars have used it since. 
So when we honor the saints, we give honor to God, the great artist who created them. So don't come to me later and say, I lost a friend because of you. I'll say, I remember, I told you. And so God, Jesus is the center of our life. And there we have St. Teresa of Lisieux. Now she's a beautiful little thing. She entered a convent when she was 15 years old and she died at the age of 24. And she said some beautiful things. She said, uh, we cannot all do great things, but we can all do little things with great love. I suggest that when you go home tonight, you put that into practice at home. How about picking up your clothes off the floor, putting them into a basket, and taking them to the place near the washing machine so your mother doesn't have to do it? You don't like my saying that, do you? Yes, some of you are guilty. Even with the mask on, I can tell it. So pick up your things. It's a small thing. Be helpful at home. Say thank you. Say thank you to your mom. Thank you to your dad, even for little things. After dinner, say to your mom, I can wash those dishes. Now you might hate washing dishes, but do it. You'll be surprised how hatred melts away after the fourth night. You'll begin to like it. You'll get good at it. Do little things with great love. How about those kids in school that have no friends, that nobody likes? You want to be a saint? Reach out to them. How about some kid who's struggling with math, and you're good in math? How about saying, I can give you a hand, I understand that stuff. These are little things. They could make us saints and do them with great love, little things. So St. Teresa of Lisieux, she would say, holiness consists simply in doing God's will and being just what God wants us to be. And then she said, it seems to me that if a small flower could speak, it would simply proclaim what the good Lord has done for it without trying to hide his gift. It would not claim to be plain or without fragrance, nor would it say the sun has faded my colors or the storm has broken my bed, knowing full well that the opposite was true. If you want to read anything about her, the autobiography of St. Teresa of Lisieux is very beautiful. Okay. Here is a young man, Carlo, Carlos, and uh, he was born in England of Italian parents. He was said to be a very gifted young man in technology, and uh, he made uh, a series on the Eucharist, was it? Eucharistic miracles. And he developed them on a website. Was that right? Yes. Uh, he died young. He died of uh, tuberculosis, TB, I think, yeah. And uh, he was proclaimed a saint not too long ago by uh, Pope Francis, a blessed, he was called blessed. And uh, he was a kid in school, if you want to be a saint, he was to notice kids in his classroom whose parents were going through a divorce and they were very sad. And he used to invite them to his home. But there is something quite beautiful he reached out to other people. He was known for his kindness, and miracles have happened to people who pray to him for something they needed 
Serene, huh? Now, here comes a, a great friend of mine, St. John Bosco. I was about 10 years old uh, when I first learned about uh, St. John Bosco, or Don Bosco, as they called him in Italy. Um, and uh, I started praying to him. I had, maybe I wasn't so bad in that I had a focus already in my life. And I used to say, one Hail Mary to him every morning on my way to school. We walked to school about three miles, three Irish miles of that. They're longer than the miles here. And I would pray to him. I wanted to enter a religious community, and I wanted to teach. So I asked him to help me. And I would have to say that in my lifetime, in difficult schools, in violent areas of cities across this land, I felt the nearness of St. John Bosco. He's the patron saint of youth. Uh, he, uh, he noticed in Turin, in Italy, that on Sunday mornings, a couple of jugglers came around and they would juggle in the church parking lot and keep the kids from going to mass. So he decided he would learn how to juggle and he became good at it. So he went out, he stood beside the jugglers and he said to the kids, I bet you I can beat those two guys. I bet you I can juggle better than they can. And if I can, you follow me. And so he started little by little. The kids said, yeah, this is the guy. This is the guy we want to follow. He never drops anything. These two guys, you're not as good as he is. So you know how kids are. They'll follow the winner for the most part. And so he starts gathering these kids. After a while, orphans came to him, kids who were in trouble. And today, uh, the Salesians, they're called, the men he, uh, he founded, found a women's community as well. And they are all over the world taking care of kids and teaching them. And they developed trade schools all everywhere for kids who didn't want to go and get academic degrees. So I pray to him, and uh, he has helped me in my lifetime. I'd recommend him to anybody. I call him a good friend of mine. Okay, I think I'm finished, and it's your turn now. Before Vito begins, I would like to remind you of that hymn. You remember the hymn, Oh, When the Saints Say It. Oh, when, oh, when the saints come marching in, I hope to be in that number when the saints come marching in. And I hope all of you will be in that number. And I'll see all of you in the place where those who live the Beatitudes will say, you know, you were right that night in the mission, even though you talked too long. Okay, now Vito, would you take the virtual pilgrimage? I'll put you up here now. <laughs>